Okay. Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to another Irene online seminar. Uh, my name is Thanasis Psaldis and I'm a postdoc at U Darmstadt, uh, working with Almudena Arcones, and I'm also chairing uh, this organizing committee. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to remind you that this seminar will be recorded and uh, hopefully we'll have it on Gina's YouTube channel early next week. Uh, and also just be mindful that this is a professional setting and we should all behave uh, accordingly. Uh, okay, and also if there are any questions, uh, just write them in the chat and we'll have a discussion session at the end of the talk. And if you want to meet and talk um, with our speaker uh, after the seminar, there's gonna be uh, an informed session of GatherTown and I'll uh, share the link in a few minutes. And now it was my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Adele Goodwin uh, from Curtin University in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, Adele is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the International Center for Radio Astronomy. Uh, she finished her PhD last year from Monash University, uh, where she worked with uh, Duncan Galloway on observations and also modeling of accreting neutron stars. Uh, Dr. Goodwin's uh, current research includes developing type 1 X-ray burst modeling software, as well as radio observational campaigns of tidal disruption events. And today she will talk to us about multidimensional modeling of the heat flow and X-ray bursts on the surface of accreting neutron stars. So whatever you ready, Adele, please take it away. Thank you, and um, thank you for having me to give this talk. So um, today I wanted to talk about a project that I began during my PhD at Monash um, and it was uh, some software that um, one of my supervisors, Alexander Hager, and I developed um, that attempts to model the heat flow and eventually X-ray bursts on the surface of accreting neutron stars. This work actually began while I was visiting Anna Watts in um, Amsterdam at the University of Amsterdam. Um, it was kind of an idea for some weird observations that she wanted to explain and it sort of developed into this more general um, software that Alex and I have now have now developed. Um, so if you don't know me, this is me in the corner here with my two dogs um, and yeah. So I'll just start with a bit of a general um, background into what kind of systems accreting neutron stars are and what kind of systems produce X-ray bursts. So here's a little schematic that I made of an accretion powered millisecond pulsar, which is a type of accreting neutron star. So you have the neutron star in the center here and it exists in a very close binary orbit with a donor star. And that donor star could be a normal main sequence star, or it could be a low mass star, or it could even be a white dwarf. And the donor star will um, overflow its Roche lobe, and the neutron star will pull that, that gas into an accretion disk around it. Um, and at some point, that accretion disk, it'll, it'll pull that material into it, and it will re reach a critical mass or surface density, and it will become unstable. Um, and this is when the system is brought into this kind of hot, bright outburst state. Um, and we see lots of different kinds of emission, but primarily X-rays coming from these systems when they're in outburst. Um, during outburst, you can actually get material transferring from the accretion disk onto the surface of the neutron star itself. Um, and this is what gives off most of the X-rays that we see as like a persistent luminosity. Um, and it's thought that the neutron star's magnetic field might actually influence how that accreted material is transferred onto the surface of the neutron star. And this is an interesting point because we actually observe on some accreting neutron stars um, hot spots in their light curves. So we see these pulsations in the X-ray flux as that hotter area is coming into and out of view as a neutron star is rotating. Um, and yeah, so perhaps that is because all of the material is being channeled by the magnetic field to hit the same location on the surface of the neutron star. So these transiently accreting neutron stars will accrete at a really low rate um, for um, months to years from the companion into that disk. And then when that disk reaches a critical mass or density, um, the outbursts will begin. And outbursts tend to last up to about a month. And here is an example of a particularly well-known um, accretion powered millisecond pulsar called SACS J1808. And it goes into outbursts approximately every four years. So you can see during an 
outburst, so we've got time on the x-axis here in days and x-ray intensity on the y-axis. You can see we get a, a sharp increase in the x-ray flux coming from the system and then it gradually decays over the next month or so and the system returns to quiescence um, to begin building the disk back up. Um, during outburst, so this is one type of x-ray emission that we can see, this persistent accretion luminosity when they're in outburst. But we also sometimes see these really, really bright, short flashes of X-ray emission coming from these systems. And these are known as thermonuclear X-ray bursts, um, and they're caused by a thermonuclear runaway of the accreted fuel on the surface of the neutron star. They're extremely bright and energetic, so about 10 to the power of 39 ergs, um, and they're very short, so they only last about a minute, so tens of seconds. And they are powered by the accreted hydrogen and helium that has built up on the surface of the neutron star, um, kind of igniting in a thermonuclear runaway. So it's reached really high temperatures and densities um, and this huge explosion occurs. Um, so depending on the um, system parameters, so for example, the composition of the accreted fuel, we get different observed properties of X-ray bursts. So this plot here shows three X-ray bursts that were observed from different systems. Um, we've got time in seconds on the x-axis and again x-ray intensity on the y-axis. And you can see we get a really sharp increase in the x-ray flux and then a slower decay as well. Um, but interestingly, so this one here from GS1826 lasts much longer than this one here from 4U1728. And it's thought that that could be because 1826 secretes primarily hydrogen. And when there's lots of hydrogen available, um, there's lots of protons around and thermonuclear bursts are powered primarily by the RP process. So there's lots of protons available. You get this kind of extended RP process burning in the tail and it goes for much longer than something like a, a helium burst, which um, doesn't have as many protons available and isn't going to have as extended RP process burning and will end up being much shorter. So based on um, what we observe and the light curves that we observe for these X-ray bursts, we can actually learn a lot about the systems that produce them. Um, so accreting X-ray pulsars are a specific type of accreting neutron star. And these are the ones that have hot spots on the surface, which are thought to be caused by magnetic channeling of the accreted fuel. Um, these hot spots are observable in the light curve and they're super useful because we can get very precise measurements of the spin period of the pulsar um, by measuring these, these pulsations as the hotspot comes into and out of view. Um, so what the, the, the main idea I want you to take away from all this information about creating X-ray pulsars is that asymmetric heat patches can be and are observed on the surface of accreting neutron stars. Um, and this is kind of one of the main um, underlying um, things that we were thinking about when we, we started developing this, this software. Um, so this is a really cool example of um, some observations from NISA of um, a hotspot and a creature of, of an X-ray pulsar. So this is a video, so I'm just going to start it. So you can see um, this plot in the bottom here shows the light curve that was observed. So you can see it wasn't quite very um, sinusoidal, there was a bit of, of um, different stuff going on. And um, R Thomas Riley and um, the, the group that worked on this deduced that that meant that there, there was actually two hotspots they were observing um, and they could model this and figure out where on the neutron star or maybe where on the neutron star these hotspots were coming from. So these plots at the top are actually um, sky maps of where they think the photons that they observed with the X-ray telescope um, were coming from. So this is super cool, but also really weird and interesting because um, canonically we think that the if the magnetic field is channeling the accreted fuel to cause these hotspots and they should be occurring at the magnetic pulse. Um, but if that is not the case, then what is causing the hotspots? Or maybe the case is that the magnetic field of the neutron star is not this simple dipole. Um, so maybe it's a lot more complex than that. And we get these kind of weird shaped hotspots with different locations and stuff like that. Um, so this brings me to the point of talking about these hotspots. And this is the, so X-ray bursts are caused by this accreted fuel um, igniting in an unstable runaway. Um, and the, um, the, one of the questions I think that is really important to answer is whereabouts on the surface of the neutron star might X-ray bursts ignite? Um, and 
previous studies, so back in like 2002, Spikowski et al concluded that X-ray bursts would always ignite at the equator. Um, and that's simply because these neutron stars are spinning really rapidly. And if they are spinning really fast, you actually can have rotationally reduced gravity at the equator compared to the pulse. And in a lower gravity environment, it's much, um, you, you reach the conditions required for an X-ray burst, so the high temperature and density, um, earlier than you do in a higher gravity environment. And so they simply concluded that X-ray bursts would always ignite at the equator. However, a lot of the previous modeling studies that have, have looked at where X-ray bursts might ignite have not considered the effect of a hotspot. Um, so perhaps if there is a hotspot somewhere on the star, that could cause heating down through those accreted layers, and we might end up getting an X-ray burst igniting underneath the hotspot rather than at the equator where it's thought that they would ignite. So this is one of the questions that we really wanted to answer um, that we were thinking about. And so we decided to write some software to try and model this. Um, but that's not the only question that we were thinking about. Um, so we were also thinking about these things called burst oscillations. So burst oscillations are observed during an X-ray burst. So here are some X-ray burst light curves from different sources. So we've got time in seconds on the x-axis and frequency and count rate on the y-axis. And you can see, so these red patches are the um, oscillations that were observed during the X-ray burst. And these oscillations um, usually occur around the spin frequency of the neutron star, but they also drift. So they're not staying at the one frequency. They tend to drift around that frequency. Um, and the mechanism that causes these oscillations is not known, but there are some theories. Um, and some people think that this they could be caused by the flame front spreading around the neutron star. And that's why you would get a slight drift in the frequency that they're observed because it's, it's, it's moving over the star. Or they could be large scale ocean modes or something like that. Um, but again, the general, I think, what we're, we're starting to conclude is that these oscillations could be caused by asymmetric heat patches during an X-ray burst. So if we're having the flame front spreading around, um, there's parts that are hotter than others, and we're ending up get it with these um, oscillations that are occurring. So perhaps there are also asymmetric heat patches during X-ray bursts, um, which is interesting to think about. Um, and I just quickly want to just give a brief overview of nuclear burning in X-ray bursts. Um, so the main thing, the main process that drives um, the thermonuclear runaway in, X, in an X-ray burst is the RP process. Um, so it's the rapid proton captures. Um, you start down, down here at hydrogen helium um, and you, you move up the chart of nucleides um, and it's thought that the RP process ends somewhere up um, here at like tellurium or somewhere. Um, but depending on the available protons, you can burn to heavy elements extremely quickly during an X-ray burst and produce lots and lots of energy. Um, so there are kind of two um, different types of nuclear burning that are important to consider in any X-ray burst modeling. Um, and the one that's really important is the RP process burning or the thermonuclear runaway. But before the thermonuclear runaway occurs, when that accretion is happening, we actually get a steady CNO or triple alpha burning um, in, that accre in those accreted layers. And that can produce energy um, and it will actually end up igniting the, the runaway that, that happens. But um, yeah, it's important to kind of think about the accreted fuel composition as it's coming in can change before the X-ray burst occurs because you have this sort of steady state um, hydrogen and helium burning. So this brings me to the model that we developed. Um, so the main problem with current models, most current detailed models of X-ray bursts are that they are one dimensional. Um, they're one dimensional because um, it's much quicker to model things in 1D um, and they just assume spherical symmetry. And this means that they, um, models like Kepler or MESA can include really detailed nuclear reaction networks um, with lots and lots of isotopes which is great, but it also means that there are currently some big unanswered questions um, that we don't quite understand about X-ray bursts. Um, so one of them is how and where does the material accrete onto the surface of the neutron star? Or if we're thinking about um, Novi, maybe a white dwarf, um, does it accrete because of the magnetic field? Is it channeled to certain locations? Um, that kind of thing. 
Another unanswered question is how does that accreted material then distribute around the surface? Um, there has been talk of perhaps there could be magnetic confinement of the accreted fuel and it could all be um, kept at a certain location on the neutron star. Um, does it just spread around quickly or slowly? Um, that kind of thing. And this is actually, this question is important because it also has applications for gravitational um, waves. And that's because if you have a, a slight, I'm going to say a mountain, but it's probably going to be more of a bump on the surface of a neutron star and it's rotating really fast, this will actually produce gravitational waves and it's something that they are, they are looking for at the moment. Um, so figuring out how that accretive material distributes and how quickly it distributes um, is super important. And then also how significant is nuclear burning to this distribution of heat and material? Um, does it affect um, how it's moving? Um, does the heat flow kind of stay in one location? Does it spread across the entire surface? Um, that kind of question. So um, thinking about these three unanswered questions and the motivation behind the um, hotspots may be um, changing the ignition location of X-ray bursts away from the equator, we um, decided to create a 3D time-dependent code that models the heat distribution on the surface of an accreting neutron star, which can account for asymmetric heat patches. Um, so to do this, we solve the time-dependent heat diffusion equation in different coordinate systems, depending on where on the star we want to model. So, um, the heat diffusion equation, um, here it is. <laughs> this is basically, at the end of the day, what our code is solving. Um, our, our, we construct a grid, so it's a grid code, um, and we solve this equation. So this is the heat diffusion equation, a, a source term, so that's the heat term, and that is just simply the heating from nuclear burning. In our grid, our cells are static, so they do not radially expand and we don't model convective heat flows yet, um, but that is something that we would like to bring into the code. So um, the things that we, are, we, we think are really important um, when thinking about how heat might move around the surface of, an, of a neutron star, uh, the, um, the density, which depends on R, the radius, um, the opacity, which depends on both the density rho and the temperature, and then this is what we're solving for, the temperature. Um, and then we have the heating from nuclear burning, which is just the energy produced from all the nuclear reactions that are occurring. So we, um, we, we solve this equation um, with, we have a time independent um, setup and also a time dependent setup. So we can solve for the steady state solution or we can solve um, evolve with time and see how things go. Um, there are a few assumptions that go into this model. Um, the biggest one is the equation of state. So um, we need like a simple neutron star equation of state um, and one in which the opacity depends on both the density and temperature. So to do this, we actually extract an opacity table from Kepler um, and Kepler is a, um, a X-ray burst modeling code. It's not just used for X-ray burst, but I use it for X-ray burst modeling, um, but it's one dimensional. Um, and so we're able to extract an opacity table from that. Um, we use conductivity from electron scattering only, and we assume that the material is fully ionized um, for our equation of state, which actually isn't that bad an assumption given the temperatures that we're working with. The other big thing, because we have a grid code, is the boundary conditions. Um, and so this is, we had to take a lot of consideration when thinking about what we were going to use for our boundaries. Um, and I think the most important one is the base boundary. So what the accreted material is actually accreting on top of, because if we have a constant temperature boundary, that can actually introduce some issues because you, you could be, if you set that as too high or something, you could be introducing heat into the model, or if it's too low, it could be like cooling. So instead we use a constant flux boundary at the base, um, but on top of the base, we have that, that constant flux boundary at the base, we actually use a substrate. Um, and so we have a non-reactive substance um, which we just use iron 56 I think and then we have the accreted layer on top of that um, and so heat can freely move in and out of the bottom of our domain um, but it's a constant flux condition. For the surface of the neutron star we assume a black body um, so we can radiate away some heat if it's necessary um, but if we want to put a hot spot in which we do in some models um, we fix that as a, as a fixed top boundary because that is then representative of the heating. 
Um, for the sides, we usually make sure our domain is large enough that the sides are not super important, um, but we do use reflective boundaries, and that just means that we can simulate half the domain rather than the entire domain if we assume it's symmetrical in the horizontal coordinate. So there are the examples that go into the model. Um, the geometry is also important. Um, so we, solve, we, we can solve in 1, 2, or 3D. We've written the code very generally. Um, initially, we only made the code 2D. Um, but then we realized that it was just as easy to make it 3D and it wasn't that more, much, well, it is more expensive, but um, it was okay. Um, so the main things that we wanted to be able to model were hotspots at the, at the poles. Um, so something like this kind of geometry. But then we were also thinking about in some models where you could have um, accretion at the equator. So you might have like a hot stripe along the equator or something like that. Um, and so we would have something something like this. But in general, we do not model the entire neutron star, we just model a subset, because otherwise we would need to have a very, very large grid and it would be very computationally expensive. So um, the, this is basically the equation of state that we use. Um, so we need profiles for temperature, density and opacity. Um, here is an example for a certain temperature. Um, so this here on the left-hand side is the surface of the neutron star, and this here is the bottom of our substrate, so down deeper into the star. The x-axis is the ignition depth, but you can think of it like radius or depth into the neutron star. Um, this is a simple temperature profile that we might start with, um, and then the density and opacity. Um, and so you can see that we have this substrate region deeper in the star, which is just a non-reactive substance, and then this is our accreted layers, which is mainly helium or, or can be hydrogen. Okay, and then the other thing that it, we really needed to think about was the that heat from nuclear burning term, so the epsilon. Um, and initially we just decided to, to use a very simple assumption about the nuclear burning. So we, we, we used just helium burning um, and we assumed that the triple L for energy generation rate was this equation from Bilston 1998. Um, and then we just literally put that in and that was all that we use. It depends on the density, temperature and mass fraction of helium. But um, we, once we got the code up and running and it was working really well, we realized that we could actually implement a nuclear reaction network pretty easily um, in the code. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, Frank Timms very nicely has some public nuclear reaction networks on his website um, and they are written in Fortran. So we translated them into Python and then just pretty much threw them straight into the code. So the, some of the results I'm gonna show you today are actually using this seven isotope um, triple alpha network um, that Frank Timms has written. And here's an example. I think these are the, the elements, the seven um, isotopes that it uses. Um, and I think this is a helium burning example. Um, but we actually more recently have implemented or are in the process of implementing a 34 isotope network as well into our code. Um, so the seven isotope network is good for helium burning, um, but the 34 isotope network can actually do hydrogen burning as well, which is what we are really excited about. Um, so that's in the works at the moment. So the final thing that we need to consider are the initial conditions because um, we're using we're solving an equation effectively. So giving it a good guess for the initial conditions means it's much um, easier and faster to, to come up with a solution. So we start with a simple analytic solution and then we find either the steady state solution or we evolve in time steps. Um, this is the initial condition and initial condition that we might give. Um, so this particular model run was for a hot spot on the surface. Um, so you can see this is a hotter region, the rest of the surface is cooler. Um, and we're going down into the neutron star, this is the base. So the base is quite a lot hotter than the surface. Um, and that's kind of consistent with um, what we think that there is this kind of base heating from the neutron star. Um, and again, this is horizontal coordinate. So here is an example of this exact run um, being, um, this is a time evolution run. So with, this is what, initially starts with, we have a hotter area and then the cooler surface. Um, and we let that evolve with time and see how the hot spot penetrates down the, through the surface of the neutron star and how that heating spreads out across the surface of the neutron star. Um, so this is pretty cool, I think. Um, so again, um, when we ended this model, we ended up with a kind of heated column underneath the hot spot. 
um, and the rest of the that heating was kind of spreading out radially much slower um, around the neutron star. Um, so this is one example of what we can we can model with this code. Um, but what's kind of interesting with this particular model is to look at the nuclear burning. Um, so this is the same model, but just a zoom in of the temperature. And in this panel here, this is the nuclear energy generation rate. So this is kind of a proxy for the nuclear burning that's happening and how much energy is being produced. So if we have a look at this, we can see that that heating is penetrating down with the temperature pretty much. Um, and we're getting all of this nuclear energy, gener energy being generated um, as that hot area is spreading around over the star. Um, this is going to keep going for a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, um, that was a, a 2D example, um, but we can do better because we've made our code 3D. So this is a model that I was running very recently. Um, so this is a 3D time dependent example. And so this model was done with the simple energy generation rate. So just the Bildstein formula, but this model is actually done with the seven isotope um, alpha network. So again, this is just um, temperature. This model does not have a hotspot. It's just kind of um, looking at the heating coming up from, from the base, I guess. Um, and let's play it so you can see the temperature is increasing. The nuclear energy generation is also increasing. But you get to a certain point where we've run out of fuel to burn down here. Um, so it's burnt to the end of the, the isotope network. And you can see that it slowly makes its way um, back to the surface. Um, so yeah, this is pretty cool. Because we have that seven isotope network, we can actually look at the abundance of the different elements at the different location um, on, on the neutron star. So this is, sorry, that's a bit small, but this is the helium mass fraction, carbon 12, oxygen, neon, magnesium, and silicon. I missed one isotope because I didn't want to have seven on a, it was not symmetrical. <laughs> it was annoying me, so I skipped one isotope. Um, but let's play this. So you can see we start with pretty much pure helium and pretty much immediately, a lot of that helium in the hotter area is being burnt to carbon. Um, and you can see we're building up eventually a bunch of silicon, um, which I think I think nickel is actually the end point of this, but silicon and nickel are the final sort of end bit of this, this isotope network. Um, so you can see that, yeah, by the end, we've got lots of carbon, some oxygen, some neon, some magnesium, no helium, or very little helium down in the hotter areas where a lot of the nuclear burning was happening. Um, and we've burnt mostly to the heavier elements. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just a, a really nice example of how we can trace the nuclear burning in those accretive layers um, in the lead up to an X-ray burst in 3D. Um, yeah. So um, that's just some examples of what, what our code can do um, and some models that we've been playing around with. Um, but we have actually already published a paper with this code. Um, so I just wanted to spend the sort of final um, section of the talk talking about this paper and the results that we found. Um, so this was the initial motivation for why we developed this software um, was that we wanted to figure out if a hotspot could cause an X-ray burst to ignite away from the equator. Um, and the motivation behind this was that there are burst oscillations observed in these two sources. Oh, that should be 1814, not 1813, my bad. Um, and these burst oscillations trace the neutron star spin exactly. Um, so they don't drift around at all. And we wanted to know why. Um, and looking at these two systems, the accreting neutron star systems, the one thing that um, kind of could have been different about these systems is they have slightly stronger magnetic fields than other accreting neutron star systems. And so we came up with this theory that perhaps the um, X-ray bursts are igniting under the hotspot at the pole. And maybe the magnetic field is confining the burning to that location. And that's why the burst oscillations, if they're tracing um, the X-ray burst burning, are staying exactly at the spin period of the neutron star. So um, we, we tested this, this theory with our, with our code. Um, and this is pretty much the main result of the paper. Um, and 
Long story short, the answer is that the X-ray bursts probably are not igniting under the hotspots, <laughs> um, but I'll explain why we think that. Um, so this plot shows a few different model runs in a very boring way. Um, so again, we've got ignition depth on the y-axis, uh, ignition column on the y-axis, um, or like kind of radial depth into the neutron star. So this is deep into the neutron star. This is the surface up here. And then we have temperature. Um, so this is lower temperature and higher temperature. Um, this dashed black line is kind of a proxy for at what temperature and depth an X-ray burst might ignite. Um, but it's not actually what we use to determine the ignition conditions of a burst, but it's just a simple analytic estimate from built in 1998 to kind of guide your eye. Um, the solid green line shows the temperature profile at the time of an X-ray burst, um, just before an X-ray burst um, ignited for the equatorial model. And so for the equatorial model, we actually reduced the gravity by 25% to um, to represent the the reduced gravity that could be um, at the equator because of the spin the spin of the neutron star. This is the most extreme case, I might add. So it's it's usually thought that the depending on how fast the neutron star is spinning, the um, surface gravity would be reduced by up to twenty five percent at the equator. Um, so we just went for the most extreme case. So that's this solid green line, and then these dashed dotted lines, the three of them are uh, the temperature profile underneath the hotspot just before an X-ray burst ignited for three different hotspot temperatures. Um, so the, uh, the red line is a hotspot of five times 10 to the seven Kelvin. Um, and you can see that the X-ray burst ignition would occur at the equator in that case, not under the hotspot because it ignites deeper um, for the column under the hotspot compared to the equator. But for the hotter hotspot, so for a hotspot of 10 to the 8 Kelvin or more, you might actually get X-ray burst ignition occurring under that hotspot rather than at the equator because it kind of hits this line at a shallower ignition depth um, than the equatorial model. So that's super interesting and super cool. Um, however, the problem is <laughs> that observations of hotspots tend to show that they do not get to the as hot as 10 to the 8 Kelvin. So this, that 10 to the 8 Kelvin would be an extremely hot hotspot. Um, in general, there are maybe maximum five times 10 to the seven Kelvin or less um, based on X-ray spectral properties of these, these observed hotspots. So the answer is an X-ray burst could ignite away from the equator under a hotspot, but only if it's hotter than 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Um, and again, observations indicate that they're probably not going to get that hot, at least for the sources that the two sources that we were looking at. So this probably doesn't explain why the burst oscillations of these these two sources um, track exactly the spin period of the neutron star. But it was still interesting um, interesting to model. Um, another thing that we could consider is the hotspot size. Um, and so this this was these tests were kind of useful for us a because they tell us the, the scales on which horizontal heat diffusion might occur and b because that tells us something about the resolution that we need for our model runs um, so you can see at one kilometer you you basically so this is a hot spot of one kilometer you basically see no horizontal heat diffusion um, at one meter you see some and at one centimeter you see a lot um, and so we basically determined that if a hotspot is greater than 100 meters, then that horizontal heat diffusion um, is, is not important. Um, so the, the hotspot size could be as large as you want it, but you'll just end up with two different solutions, one for where there is no hotspot and one for where there, where there is a hotspot. Um, okay, so that's the science results um, from, from the, the paper that we published um, in MNRAS. Um, but I just wanted to quickly finish off with um, talking about what else this code can do. Um, so we're able to model the, currently we're able to model the heat flow and distribution on the surface of an accreting neutron star. Um, we have time evolution um, and we are implementing a, a more complex nuclear reaction network that hopefully will be able to actually model a thermonuclear runaway, so an X-ray burst in 3D. Um, 
But we can also apply this model to many other systems. Um, so for example, accreting white dwarfs um, with nova explosions is very similar setup to an accreting neutron star. You just have to change the equation of state slightly, which is simple to do in our model. Um, and this is actually a, a plot from a project that Alex Hager was working on with a student using this code um, of a nuclear burning flame in accretion on a white dwarf. Um, so this is the energy generation rate. This, and um, yeah, they were able to actually model this kind of nuclear burning flame occurring um, on a white dwarf instead of a neutron star. Um, we could also model maybe um, ignition of helium burning in type 1a supernovae in the sub Chandrasekhar model. Um, again, would be accreting onto a white dwarf. Um, but more generally, we could, we could look at heat distribution calculations of any star in a binary system or even of planets that are subject to irradiation or uneven heating. Um, so yeah, this is something that we are looking into um, just because it's, it's super easy to put in hot heated areas anywhere in our model um, because of the 3D nature of the code. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of applications of this software. Um, in the future, the first thing we're going to do is get the 34 isotope nuclear reaction network working. Um, this is pretty much almost there. Um, and we're actually going to publish and release the code on PIP. So it's all written in Python. Um, and we've actually received um, about a year of software developer support for this code through um, ADAX, which is the Australian Data Astronomy Something Computing Services. Um, and they, the software developer is still currently working on the code. He was able to um, implement a different solver to the one that we were using, which sped up the code significantly and means that we could run 3D time evolution in a reasonable amount of time, <laughs> um, which is really nice. Um, and he is in the process of packaging the code and we're, we're going to release it on PIP. So stay tuned. Um, and then finally in the grand, broader scheme of, um, it would be really nice to actually include hydrodynamics and convection um, and things like that, rather than just modeling the heat diffusion. Um, yeah, so in summary, um, we've created a 3D time dependent code that models the heat distribution on the surface of an accreting neutron star, um, which means that we can account for asymmetric heat patches um, to look at how heat is just distributed across the surface from accretion. Um, and where X-ray bursts might ignite and how asymmetric heat patches could affect the um, heat flow and X-ray burst ignition locations. So far, we've explored the effect a hotspot has on the ignition location of X-ray bursts for two sources. Um, we plan to extend this study to explore the effect of rotation rate. So I did mention that we only looked at the one case with 25% reduced gravity at the equator, but that's the most extreme case. Um, so maybe if, the, we had a slightly slower spinning neutron star and slightly higher gravity at the equator, um, the effect might not be as extreme and we might actually get X-ray bursts igniting under the hotspot. Um, and we're working on including a more detailed nuclear action network to model an X-ray burst in 3D, which is coming very soon, um, so stay tuned. Um, the code is publicly available already, but it will be available more easily to install on PIP soon. Um, and it very generally solves the heat equation in different coordinate systems and allows for asymmetric heat patches. So this has applications from accreting white dwarfs to irradiated planets. So if you have something um, cool that you want to model, get in touch or feel free to download the code when it's, when it's available. Thank you. Great talk, Adele. Thanks so much. Okay, so now let's move to the question session. If you have questions, you can raise your hand or you can just uh, unmute yourself and speak. Okay, I guess I can start first. Okay, um, so I have some questions regarding like the coding part. So, okay, it was great that we saw the resolution that you can get like down to like centimeters or I guess millimeters. How does that affect like your computational time? Yeah, so um, as we go up in dimensions, it it scales very badly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of um, course. So if we're modeling like 2D models, we can get quite a decent resolution. Um, but in 3D currently, it takes a long time to have a high resolution model. Mm -hmm. um, so that again, like the models that I showed that were in 3D, the resolution would not be something that I would publish in a scientific paper because it's not physically 
accurate enough. <laughs> yeah. um, but in terms of speed, I wanted to be able to run the models in like half an hour. So um, yeah, but we we also have been doing some models on a supercomputer where we can actually right. have a higher resolution because um, we've the ADAX developer that we've had working on the code has made it um, multi um, has implemented multi processing so that we can mm -hmm. um, yeah. we can um, parallelize the code. So yeah. yeah, the answer is it's it's yeah it scales badly with with multiple dimensions. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, Hans, please. Hello, do you understand me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, I'm not a neutron star uh, 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 researcher, so no idea about the system. Uh, I'm doing hydro, and when you uh, I, and when you um, uh, started presenting your code, I was wondering since you were focusing on the heat transfer on the surface mm -hmm. of the star. And you know, hydro for me is advection is always very important and stuff is flowing from A to B, right? Mm -hmm. To get a feeling about the importance, you said these X-ray bursts take place every couple of years. And when you showed the numbers, also unfamiliar to me, but there were always uh, mass column densities over one meter of, what was it, two, time, uh, two times 10 to the nine, grams per square centimeter. How much mm -hmm. mass sits in this one meter shell at the surface of the neutron star in comparison to the stuff that the star uh, accretes in a four years period? You see, I want to have a feeling how much uh, of, a, so to say, the exchange time scale of material on the surface, giving me a feeling how much of the material raining down at the hotspot is spreading across the uh, across the neutron star surface? Do you have a yeah. number? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have a number off the top of my head, um, but I guess so. it depends on, I mean, these things don't all accrete at the same rate is the thing. So there's this accretion rate um, and we can use the accretion luminosity as like a proxy of that accretion rate. Um, but depending on, I guess that accretion rate from the disk to the surface of the neutron star, um, that would tell us how much mass is accreted. And I'm sure I could, I could easily get the number for you, but I just don't have it off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but yeah, this layer, because we're working in such a dense environment, like neutron stars are so dense, um, this, this layer is physically quite thin, but it is very massive. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. Um, perhaps one more question. When I, you started to talk about the hotspot. I was also surprised that you started with examples where the hotspot had a diameter of only a, of the order of one meter. Mm -hmm. To me, that was also very surprising since the neutron star is what is it, one, two kilometers of radius, give or take. And to me, that sounds like you pinch it with a needle at one point. So very, very <laughs> concentrated. So my feeling was this is much too small. I mean, but I may be wrong. As I said, I have no intuition here. How yeah, no, I mean, and that's exactly right. So there are estimates of what size the hotspots might be from the size of the magnetic polar cap. Um, if we're assuming that the hotspots are caused from the um, magnetic field channeling the accreted fuel. Um, and these estimates put the hotspots at like a kilometer or maybe two kilometers. Um, but for the sake of that model, because I wanted to be able to show that um, heat diffusion horizontally, I made it much smaller so that you could see the, the horizontal heat diffusion. But in reality, the horizontal heat diffusion is not really important because it happens on such small scales. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Adele? And they can ask one more in the meantime. Um, so many people, when they're doing uh, simulations like in supernova explosions or in just mergers, they play a lot with the equation of states. And you just said, OK, I used a very simple one because I don't want to get into very much trouble. Do you have any plans in the future to just see the effect of the different equation of states in your code? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. Um, in the future, that is something we, we, we could look at. But right now, I think um, there are more pressing things that we would want to do, um, 
kind of make sure like the, the, the code at the moment is based on a lot of assumptions. Um, no. The main one being that we don't even include like convection or um, like hydrodynamics. Um, so first we would want to implement that before we would trust anything that we could yeah. say about changes in equation of state. <laughs> that makes sense, that makes sense. Any more questions? I don't see any other hands. Yeah, I'll just have one last one. Uh, so you showed in your introductory slides the picture with a hotspot and then a hot stripe. Mm -hmm. So have these hot stripes have been observed or it's only hot spots? No, they, ha they, they haven't been, I wouldn't say they've been um, definitely observed, but I oh. think the, the groups that are looking at nicer observations of X-ray pulsars are finding that these hot spots are not necessarily these perfect circular things at the poles. Yeah. Um, so there could be um, different shapes or locations for these, these hotter areas, but also that the motivation behind having that hotter area at the equator was mm -hmm. if you were looking at a neutron star where the magnetic field was not necessarily um, influencing the accretion flow and it was just all being accreted to the equator. Okay. Uh... Okay, Chiranjit, and then Hans for the last one. <laughs> okay, sorry, coming back to you. One one more question that came to me uh, or came to my mind initially when we were talking about the question about ignition at, at the equator or at the poles. I was yeah. wondering why a low gravity favors an early ignition. Intuitively, I would have expected the opposite. High gravity, I would have thought, makes the stuff more dense, being more compact, meaning higher density favors yeah, nuclear reaction. So why is a low gravity environment favorable? I think actually with the higher gravity, with things more dense, it's much harder to penetrate the heat into the star, I think. Um, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just like when you have something that's that dense, I think the, when it's, I mean, yeah, this is again, um, just me thinking through, but I think, I think that's what happens um, because we do tend to see in the lower gravity models um, that ignition occurs faster or more easily or shallower. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I, I had a question. Could you please uh, go to the figure where you were showing uh, this, uh, depending on the amount of hydrogen you have, you have this uh, different uh, time scale of uh, this uh, decay of this burst. Uh, I don't remember which. Oh, the was. observations? Yes, 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 in the observation. We'll get that. this one. Yeah, Oops. this one, this one. Yeah, yeah, exactly this one. So here you, you, I mean, just correct me if I am saying it wrong. So the one with this uh, long time scale of decay, it has more hydrogen, you said, uh, mm -hmm. in the system. And then if you have more helium, then it, it does, does not have hydrogen for a long time. So this is why this, uh, uh, this lower left-hand side figure. Mm -hmm. So the system, which is, uh, I think you did not talk about much, the one uh, which is on the right in the bottom. I, mean, I see some uh, small time scale peaks in between this broad peak. Uh, why is that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the, the light curves of X-ray burst observationally are not straightforward to interpret. Um, but one thing that can actually happen during the burst, and I'm not sure if this, I think this might be one of those, um, is that you can get this thing called photospheric radius expansion. And so you can see that the top of this, this light curve is quite flat. Um, mm -hmm. as in it hasn't gone up in energy, it's just kind of gone out for longer. Um, and this, this is um, basically what happens is that the, the luminosity of the burst reaches the Eddington limit, which is the maximum possible um, luminosity. And so rather than releasing, um, getting brighter, it ends up with the photosphere of the neutron star expanding. And so as a result, you have the same amount of energy being released um, for 
a longer amount of time and then it will end up decaying. And so these kind of dips and fluctuations, I think are a result of that, but again, they're not, um, yeah, interpreting these observations is, is never straightforward. And there are people who, who are much more um, qualified to talk about this than me. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. All right. Uh... Any other questions that I can see? No. Okay, so let's thank uh, Adel one more time for her excellent talk. And uh, if you want to meet with her, I'm just posting the Gather Town link uh, for everyone. So we'll move to that space and um, Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks uh, to the next uh, Irina seminar. And